we've, we've got good time for a conversation this morning and we've got a, a breakout session for the few of you who want to tunnel down a bit more into some of what I'm saying and, uh, and another session as well this afternoon. So lots of time for conversation and uh, very generous of somebody to lay on the rain so I'd feel properly at home, which was really, <laughs> surely decent. Um, thanks. <laughs> uh, I've been having the time of my life, my life lately, um, actually, in all sorts of ways. Uh, where shall I start? Well, here, here perhaps. I, um, I, this is my boat. I sail uh, an old boat. Uh, I, I didn't buy it new, you know. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous old thing. It's 104 years old, um, made of um, oak, and it weighs 20 tons. And uh, we haven't had it very long. We, we moved into it from a sort of a Grand Prix carbon fibre, fluffy, sort of modern thing. And, um, and the first thing we did when we, got in it, got, when we bought it was to look at all the systems and think, oh, some of this stuff isn't going to work. And, uh, and we ripped out some of the systems that had been there for 100 years or so. You know. and, uh, and, of course, about three months later, we put them all back because uh, it turned out that 100 years of prototyping was, was pretty good. We've, we've now got... Um, a boat that isn't a million miles away from what it, it would have looked like in the 19... Well, it was built in 1907. Um, uh, not as old as Evansville, but going back a fair way. And, um, and we've filled it full of technology too. When you get down below deck, it's got wireless network running, it's got computer systems, it captures... There's 100 data points, it captures every second that it's sailing, feeds us all that data back... Um, during the race and, and afterwards. Uh, somehow it's that combination of, of wise old experience and modern technology has, has made a pretty, a pretty exciting boat. I think that's quite a nice analogy for where we are with, with education. You know, a, a lot of good teachers know, you know, how to make teaching and learning seductive and engaging and delightful and ambitious and challenging and provocative. Uh, and now we've got technology to stir into that mix... And what we've got, I think, is pretty much unstoppable. The thing we don't yet know how to do with the boat is stop it. It weighs 20 tonnes. It, <laughs> it goes awfully quick. <laughs> and uh, um, when people sail across the front of it, you know, we just shout goodbye to them, really, because <laughs> <laughs> they are going to die, really. It's pretty simple. <laughs> I think um, we don't know how to stop this generation either, and I don't want to stop them. I think they're just hurtling forward. And I don't just mean the, the kids, I mean the teachers too. Around the world, people are getting pretty excited about all this. Uh, I was in China last week. Um, I was there again last March. Um, last week, um, we were talking to a group of head teachers, and before we started, this bunch of kids all leapt up on stage with their iPad orchestra, and, um, and they're, they're performing... Uh, a quite interesting piece of traditional Chinese music from their iPads. The girl in the middle is singing into her iPhone and sort of modulating her voice, with just got finger control to modulate her voice as she's singing. The chap there behind them uh, was actually a guest from, uh, from, from over here. He's over, over in the States. And he, um, he leapt up to film them and became, as you see, so captivated by what they were doing that he forgot all about the filming, was peering over their shoulder. China has really discovered that... Um, 3,000 years of history doesn't begin to prepare them for where they are. This is what Kenneth Chen was saying. Ken Chen's their Minister for Education at the uh, national level. He was saying this just last March. And it's interesting stuff when you think where China was uh, just five years ago with those sort of factory schools and kill and drill curriculum. And now they're saying, look, we're not going to stay top of this if we don't do it differently. Um, and And He's also saying that this isn't just about content knowledge. You know, that that, that data is out there. The content is available online. What, what matters at this moment, above all else, is learning to learn. Uh, and he took a moment to remind us all that just down the road in Singapore, where they wrote, they write a five-year plan for four years. Every year I help Singapore write their five-year plan. It seems slightly bizarre. <laughs> oh, that's not right. Let's write another one, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, I've stopped now, but they're still doing it. Um, and one of the things they say in their five-year plan, of course, now is that to, um, 
we might teach less so that we might learn more because the space for ourselves to learn is going to be a really, really important part of where we're all going. And uh, it's not just China, you know, over in, um, over in, the, uh, over in the Middle East, you know, there's vigorous, vibrant communities of primary school children pulling down their three, 4,000 years of, of scholarship and history into their learning communities too. Now, you know, you all might start to think, golly gosh, these are big countries moving really fast. So 1.17 million schools in China. I mean, just to give you a sense of the, the scale of it all, here's, um, this is a project I was with, involved with um, in China back in 2007, where we, we built this rather exciting ELO. Amongst other things, I'm chairman of a company, Learning Possibilities. Sort of says what it does on the team. You know, we, we do big, big national projects. And... Um, we set this project up to tie together their, their publishing industry with their television industry and an online community of children. And I was kind of cautious about this and said, well, I think we should run a pilot first and let's not get, let's not get too um, ahead of ourselves. And, uh, and they said, yeah, OK, let's, let's run the pilot, let's do that. And, um, and the pilot, as you can see there, was for, um, was for 20 million children, you know. <laughs> Which seemed to me like quite a big pilot, to be honest, you know. <laughs> you know, if it goes well, we'll roll it out to some big numbers, you know. <laughs> um, but actually, although that's where everybody was, I think, um, back then, where we are now is really interesting, and it's why I'm here, it's why I've come, why I've, I really enjoyed Skyping to you all. Although people sat at the front when I Skyped in, how did that happen? <laughs> that's what, get it. Get this jacket tested when they get home. <laughs> where we are is, is here. It's where small communities. This is, a, this is a small town in Thailand where the kids are out wearing these, proudly wearing these researcher shirts to capture their ideas about what great learning might look like. It's not their national government that's doing it. This is, um, this is in Silkeborg in Denmark where I'm, I'm helping the town and district redesign its, its learning. It's a beautiful place. Like, it has a river as, as, as beautiful as yours. They've got canoes. Um, they've got extraordinary classrooms. This is one of their classrooms and look much like a classroom. Um, this is one of their primary schools. One of the joys there is when you, when you walk into the primary school, uh, it has a bread oven right in the heart of it. And, uh, <laughs> and every morning they put in fresh bread. So the kids come through the door. And there's this lovely smell of fresh bread fills the whole place, absolutely gorgeous. When it's a special day, they put pizza in, and the kids walk in and go, whoa, something special going to happen today. You know? <laughs> I can smell it in the air. You know? <laughs> These are all about communities. These are all about memberships. These are all about collegiality and mutuality. They're all about small groups of people getting together to transform learning. And we absolutely make no mistake, we're in the middle of what is effectively a pedagogic Egypt going on here, where... People are transforming learning from the bottom up and whatever happens at the national level almost doesn't matter apart from the resourcing because the innovation that's driving all this forward is down at the school level, down at the district level, down at the community level and indeed will be at the family level. You know, families and parents and grandparents is a key part of learning. It's one of those untapped resources that are going to be so important to us over the next few years. And look, here's, um, uh, here's the north. This is not a great photograph, but it, this is up in the north of Norway. I have an exciting project running up there on the Barents Sea coast. Barents Sea is, is uh, well, if you can imagine your geography, it's a bit it used to be covered in ice before the ice all melted. Now the ice has melted, they found more oil under the ice. Woohoo, let's dig more oil. You know. <laughs> yes, yes, that is irony, I think. <laughs> um, but uh, there's only about 500,000 people live in the whole of the north of Norway. And about 40% of their children only complete high school. More than half of them never finish high school. It's not what you expect from Scandinavia, is it? People sell you this line that Scandinavians all, you know, they're all fabulous at reading by the time they're eight and geniuses by 11. Well, this lot um, don't even finish school. And yet the Norwegians want the, ex the mineral uh, uh, rights to be exploited by their local folk. So they've said, OK, in four years, we want to make the kids in the Barentsea Coastal District the smartest kids in Europe. 
and let's get cracking. Now, I went out to see them, uh, crikey, um, uh, beginning of last autumn and showed them some of the things I'm going to be show showing you. And this was just before Christmas when they opened the first of their uh, ICT innovation centres. And I only put it on the screen because there's so much happening on, on there, but just to sort of glance at it for a moment, you know, they've got interesting and playful seating, they've got um, children sitting on tiered boxes in super classes, they've got kids connecting to other kids all around the world. And this was, this was our vision of what was happening in the conference that opened their new project. It was 12 weeks from the first time I spoke to them, to them getting all that moving. So this is about communities. This is about small scale. But flip, it is also about going jolly fast. And there is no time to hesitate with all this. The old days of let's pilot it and reflect and do some iteration and then maybe have another pilot and then see if we can't embed some of that in our legislation. Those are gone. This is a bit like the, um, the early days right here, you know, right at the pioneering days in what, when were you, 18, 12? Somewhere around there, weren't you? Uh, you know, people would, have, people would have stood there with their wagons and said, I'll tell you what, let's do this. And I don't think they said, let's, let's set up a local pilot. And let's, <laughs> let's see six wheels, three wheels, let's see what works, you know. Um, they just absolutely went for it. That pioneering local spirit is absolutely back. And, uh, and that's why I'm here, because I can't think of many people better than you with your history of making those good judgments for the last 200 years. Not many people are going to be able to make them going forward. Look, um, I've got some interesting stuff going on. This is, um, this is, this is one thing. Um, I'm not playing the audio on this, Steve, so don't, don't panic that it's all gone quiet. <laughs> Um, how many of you saw this movie? Gosh, that's a lot. Um, well, 52 of my students were working on this movie. I'm, st I'm still a professor in the media school in Bournemouth University. That's half the production team on Avatar uh, were our students. We were pretty pleased about all that. Um, they were even more pleased about all that. They cleared their debts in about six months, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the surprises when you look back on who those 52 were is that two-thirds of them were kids that would have been regarded as difficult uh, 15 years before. Uh, profound levels of dyslexia characterised more of the children than didn't. Uh, these were kids who 15, 10, 20 years ago, we'd have said, gosh, we'd better mend them so they can fit into the world that we've built of you know, linear notational um, uh, forms of, of, of textbooks that read from start to finish, of uh, classes that started and finished at fixed times, you know, of ringing a school bell and expecting a thousand children to be simultaneously hungry and all the bizarre things that we were doing you know, 20 years ago. This lot were special and were unique and because they were special they are hugely valuable. So one of the new things we learn from this as we move forward is that the diversity of children you've got, and you like us, you're embracing personalization and differentiation and all the other things that have moved us on from the old factory models of learning. That variety isn't just morally appropriate, it's economically appropriate as well. You know, your economic future depends on your ability to make the best of everybody, not to make everybody what you had prejudged to be the best. That's a really subtle but important difference. So. Um, where should we go from here? Well, let's just go to here. Uh, this is fun. I don't know if you use Tag Galaxy, but it's a great way of looking at um, um, Flickr images. So I'm just going to go and look at um, education, I think. All this does, it does a search through Flickr for uh, images. It's a great, great little website. It says, by the way, did you mean education or did you mean children or schools? No, I really did mean education, you know. <laughs> And it's going to go off and just find lots of images. And what's really interesting, when you search the world for images that are tagged with the word education, what you get back, of course, and this is only the first 235 of half a million or so, but look, you can see what you get. You get faces. You get people. Learning is always and everywhere about people. Rather sadly, by the way, if I search for universities, I'll get buildings, which... <laughs> Maybe it says a lot, you know. Um, it says a lot, I think, about the way our universities have lost their way. You know, buildings and structures and systems have become more important than people. But in education and learning, 
it still is absolutely fundamentally about people. And, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about mostly today. It's become extraordinarily cool to learn. This is um, our television in Europe is full of learning. You can't turn on television now without finding people learning to cook. This is a, a celebrity um, star going up in flames, really, a bit of a shame, but there we are. <laughs> Plenty more of them. You know, this is um, a celebrity newsreader learning to dance. He wasn't the most um, elegant, I think it's fair to say. This is, uh, we have a great obsession now with um, taking whole villages and teaching them to become choirs. You know, the, our television, like your television, is awash with programmes about learning. And learning has never been more cool, uh, which is exciting, um, but would be more exciting if it wasn't for the, the problem of what is it that we're learning for. Our lives in the last um, decade have been filled with the most unexpected things. And, and that's not an accident. That is the product of technology. What technology has done it's allowed us to, a little bit like Icarus, you know, fly a bit closer to the sun. It's allowed us to take bigger risks. You know, the, um, when I was, I was taking off from Heathrow, was it yesterday? I'm not, I'm not very good on time zones. I've kind of lost the whole world a bit, you know. <laughs> China, Denmark here, I think going back to Venice, which is nice. Um, uh, yesterday, I think, when I took off from Heathrow, as I was sitting on the runway and looked out of the window, you could see four planes in the sky coming down to that one runway. They are literally um, nose to tail, well, with a little bit of space between them, but not much. We can only do that because of computer systems. And so when a little whiff of volcanic ash swept across the sky, the whole thing ground to a halt because we'd, we'd built something that was just too near the margin. When our banks... I think bankers have always been greedy and incompetent. I don't think that's new. It's just, <laughs> just how they are, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> You know the kids that you've had passed through your school. You know the ones who go on to be bankers. You don't need me to say any more, really. But, um, but what technology allowed them to do was to be more greedy and more incompetent because they could push the loans just to the very edge of disaster and indeed beyond. And, of course, the same was true of oil, oil drilling. You know, with, there's dear old BP drilling oil a mile down. Know how to drill it, don't know how to mend it. Um, uh, with all the catastrophic consequences to your, um, to your flora and fauna and, uh, and foreshores down in the Gulf Coast. You know. This is all about technology allowing us to take risks and when it goes wrong, the unexpected consequences occur. The implications of that for our teaching and learning are more profound than anything else, more profound than the technology itself because we have to prepare our children to go into a world that is full of surprise. We've got to be able to prepare them for completely the unexpected. Now, we're not going to prepare them for that with a set of examinations where they sit down and at this time of year, well, certainly in the Northern Hemisphere, this time of year they kind of tremble, they open the exam paper and they think, I really hope there's no surprises. And the teachers are sitting outside thinking, golly gosh, I really hope I've prepared them for everything. Uh, nothing could be, could be less appropriate for the world that they're going into. We're taking them into a world which is going to astonish them. We're taking them into a world which is going to challenge and provoke them every single time. There's a lovely story about... Um, I'm a great sailor, as I think you will have gathered from the old boat at the beginning, but um, I'm also doing a lot of work with our elite coaches for the 2012 Olympics, which will be in London. And um, one of the bits of work we're doing is on preparing our athletes to cope with the unexpected. And one of the things I use with our elite coaches is a wonderful quote from the American star sailor, who was 57, exceptionally old for, a, for an Olympic athlete, by the way, um, at the Beijing Olympics. And he arrived at the Beijing Olympics. And after, after about day two, I think he was lying second overall. He turned up with a boat built for spectacularly light winds because all the data from, from Beijing, from Qingdao, where the sailing was, said it is never windy here in August. It never had been for 10 years. So he arrived at the boat tuned to the lightest possible weather. You know. and, and, of course, the thing we had not allowed for was technology because the dear old Chinese in their um, rather efficient way thought um, they'd better turn the smog off for the Olympics. So they just shut down all the factories downstream of the, uh, of the Olympic site. And, and lo and behold, we had a blue sky. And if you think back to your 
school geography, you know, blue sky, August, hot land, air rises, thermal breezes, flipping windy Olympics, you know. <laughs> was, was the windiest one we'd seen this side of Atlanta, you know, which was pretty windy because of the thunderstorms. And the quote from the American star sailor, who ended up practically last, by the way, because his, his boat optimised for light weather was, was about as handy as a concrete duck, you know, it's useless, you know. He said in a rather um, endearing way, he said, we expected the unexpected, he said, but I never expected this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the parameters of what we might not expect, you know, are, are, are boundless. You know, our kids have got to be ready for that. Now, the one place in their learning where they get astonished and surprised and challenged and provoked is where technology impacts on their learning. It's been a Trojan horse for bringing the unexpected into teaching and learning. It's been a fabulous way of challenging systems. It's been a way of making ministers, parents, grandparents, peers, nations, sit up and take notice and say, golly gosh, I never expected the kids to be doing that. And that is what has to characterise the rest of your professional lives. Because you know, if you're not astonishing the kids, they won't be astonishing you back. And, and what people are trying to do all around the world is to build that level of astonishment. Look, um, let's look at a couple of examples. Here's, um, I find myself building a school for my granddaughter. Now, this is slightly over the top, I know, but um, <laughs> what, what's a granddad to do, you know? <laughs> uh, the local schools needed to improve. The head teachers wanted to improve. They knew I had an interest in the island where she lives, and they came to me and said, come on, Stephen, you can help. And I said, well, okay. Um, so last week, we announced um, a new school. It's going to be on the whole island. It's an astonishing school. It's a 0 to 21 school. You crawl in, as it says in the brochure, as a baby, and you don't leave till you graduate. So there is no phase break. There is no stop for primary or secondary. There is no university. You just go right on through. And, uh, and it's staged, not age, so you can go as fast as you like. We will have kids graduating before they're 18 for sure without any fees at all, uh, because they'll have done their entire school and university um, life uh, as part of their compulsory school attendance. It's, got, um, it's broken up into little home bases of only 300 children. We are so desperate to get our mums on board. We have a mumology degree. Uh, you go to mumology. We don't spell it with an O. Mumology, not momology. Uh, but you go to mumology.net and you'll see we've graduated 30, 34 mums now. Um, what do they study? Their children. You know, where's your research population? Here she is, you know. Um, we would have, we'd have dadology, but in this particular case, the dads are mostly run away, to be honest, you know. So if we could catch them, we'd enrol them, you know. Um, <laughs> and it's got playfulness throughout. Uh, and one of the things people have said to us about that is... You can't possibly do that. Oh, and by the way, we've built it in rented premises. We've built it in the old empty premises that are getting thrown up by the changes in the economy, by changes in retail. We've built it actually in the heart of a business park. So the, the place is mapped onto a hotel, a swimming club, a gym, uh, a, a startup. You know, our kids will be doing internships by so literally stepping out of one door and into another. And so, so we built a brand new school for nearly 2,000 children with no money. So, you know, and everybody said, oh, that's, you can't do that. And it, made, it led me to think a little bit about all the times in my career so far when people said, but you can't. And, and you know, I think that has so far characterised everything I, I've done and will for sure characterise everything you know, you've done. When, we've, when we put the first kids together um, and schools together on the, the World Wide Web, this was right, right back in 1995 and the web code was only released the end of 93, so the big database-driven website, and our national um, uh, uh, body that was governing computers in schools then wrote me this rather, rather um, well, actually rather snotty letter, to be honest, to say that I couldn't, I couldn't do this because the URLs looked confusing, because the URLs were generated by a database. Children would be confused by the, the, the URL, supposed to be a universal resource locator. Where is the PDF, you know, that sort of thing. And I said, actually, I think the internet's probably built upside down. It's, it's built around resources. It should be built around people. All your life you've spent going around the internet looking for people. All you can find are the damn resources. You know, it's very frustrating. <laughs> you want to have a universal person locator, which is 
almost what Facebook is and almost what blogs are and almost what Google Plus is and almost what Twitter is, but just not quite, you know. And then, um, but it worked spectacularly well. And then um, a bit later on, we built this rather wonderful project of building little robots for four-year-old kids. And uh, the literature at the time said four-year-old children cannot reflect on their own learning. There is no meta-level reflection on, on, uh, on learning for four-year-olds. I, mean, I bet there is, we thought. And we built these little robots with the kids. So the kids were the designers of this. And learner voice is key to all this, of course. Remember, we, we started the project. It was called Etui, which is French for a precious thing that you keep in your pocket. You know, we, we imagined it would be something about the size of this mouse or something along those lines. You know. we said to, and we'd send little mock-ups to the kids and say, carry that around. What do you think about, about that? And one, we said, how big do you think it would be? One little girl said... I don't care what size it is, I just want to be able to program it and ride it home after school. That was sort of, you know, okay, that's probably bigger than we thought. You know. So we built these um, little intelligent um, uh, robots. I've put the Google search in there if you want to follow any of these things up, but little Etui um, project. But uh, I, you know, it worked with four-year-olds. I thought, I wonder if it worked with others. So I went to the city of London on a Friday night. This was back in the 90s, you know, and... Uh, took a sack of little etuis with me and emptied them all out on the floor of London pub overlooking the, um, the Thames, um, which, is, which is where I live in the winter. And the pub was full of bankers. And, um, uh, and I just turned all the robots on and left them scampering around the floor. So they were all in there drinking their sort of champagne cocktails and so on. And my little things were rushing up and sort of sniffing their ankles. And, you know, within, within 20 minutes, they were down on their knees um, playing and reflecting on their learning. It turns out that everybody, you know, given the right provocation can, can reflect on learning, even, even bankers. And then when we, when we built this project, which was a big Tesco school net project, which was at the time, this was in the Guinness Book of Records as the biggest internet learning project in the world. It was, I was well excited. I thought we were going to get free Guinness. I was quite, it's, <laughs> there's, a, there's an Irish pub just next door to the hotel I'm staying at. I had a Guinness last night. It reminded me, when we, when we hit the Guinness Book, I was expecting a tanker to arrive. You know. <laughs> We're ready. You know. <laughs> we got a certificate and nothing else. You know. <laughs> Deeply disappointing. But at the heart of the task was that, you see that graph there, that's the age graph of kids. We set the same task for the six-year-olds as the 16-year-olds. One of the tasks was find the oldest person where you live and ask them for their earliest memory of school. Lovely projects. And people say, you can't set the same task for a 16-year-old and a 16-year-old. And we said, I bet you can. They'll do it differently. Sometimes they'll do it together, but it'll work. And of course it did work. Um, it was fab. You know? And then we, I was asked by the then Prime Minister, um, Tony Blair, phone me up, bizarrely. Um, actually, it's a rather funny phone call. He phoned up and said, I'm going to announce a new college of leadership um, shortly. We're building a sort of... College of School Leadership, which is jolly welcome. And I, and I wasn't sure what to say. Oh, well, well, well done, sir. You know, jolly good. You know. <laughs> Carry on. <you> know. <laughs> um, and he said, no, no, you don't understand. It's, um, it's going to take a while to build. I, I thought you might do something virtual in the meantime. Well, something virtual in the meantime is quite a good offer, isn't it, really? So I, I said, well, I certainly can. I, I, yeah, give me two weeks and I'll, I'll put the whole team on it. I had 96 people working with me. I put the whole team on it and we'll come back to you and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll spec it all out, you know. Because head teachers are pretty reluctant learners, we've been told. You know, they're the least likely people to be wired in the 1980s. And, 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 and then he said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm speaking on Thursday. <laughs> this, was, this was Tuesday lunchtime. You know? <laughs> so we had 24 hours to invent uh, an online community for 21,000 head teachers, which was great because... We just invented a really expensive one. <laughs> we knew he was going to say yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was fabulous. Uh, you know, we had 21,000 head teachers engaged in it. And you could feel then, palpably, the power of a community of practice, of people that care about the same thing and share it with each other. You could feel how strong it was. I read one of the exciting things for me coming here has been to look through that list of breakout sessions you're all doing and, and see, as, as, you, as you heard in the introduction, that it's you doing this stuff, you know, that the power of your community to co-respond. Well, people would have said five years ago, you can't do that. But you can. And it doesn't matter. We could look at a thousand of these. This was 
I took a thousand children who had all been excluded from school and uh, was told that if we got 2% of them back on track, it would be worth the, um, worth the project funding. And after one year, we got 98% of them back on track. And even more surprisingly, these kids who'd been expelled from school were outperforming the schools they'd been thrown out of, which was quite impressive. You know, now, I, I'd love to claim... I won't run all of these. We'd be here all day. We'll maybe come to more of these in the breakout session. But I'd love to claim this was because I was, I was wonderfully talented or exceptional, a genius in some way. None of that's true. I think, I think this is a measure of my own incompetence, really, because... Each one of these projects, I thought I was being the most ambitious bloke on the planet, but each one of these projects, the people involved in them outperformed my best expectations. And I didn't know then, and I don't know now, and I don't expect you know, just how good your kids could be, might be, should be. But I'll tell you what, um, in 32 years of all this, which is a long time, I can't think of a project that failed. I can't think of a moment when I was disappointed by what happened. And that's not because I've been a good judge. That is because the baseline is so low. You know, our view of what learning might look like compared to what it might actually look like, there's a heck of a gap between the two. And the exciting thing for you, as I know a lot of you know already, is that you know, when you move into these project-based, collaborative, challenging, unexpected seductive, delightful, engaging learning experiences, you see kids that are absolutely stellar. It's like throwing a, a match into a box of fireworks as a short pause, and then, blimey, do you get a show. Uh, and that's where we are with all this, absolutely where we are. Around the world, people are just starting to realise just how good their kids might be, and they're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Let's, let's glance at a few... Um, ex examples. Here's, here's three. This is a group of children I was working with in, um, in Melbourne and uh, they'd set themselves a task, primary age children, they set themselves a task of performing as a band, uh, as a rock band, two guitars, drums and a keyboard and um, they said, right, in six weeks from a standing start we're going to turn up we're going to do a gig, three, three tunes. Uh, none of us can play anything yet. Uh, we're going to do it from, we're going to go to YouTube, we're going to pull down resources. There's, these are primary age kids, elementary age kids, they're going to pull down high school resources. And I turned up on the night before the event and took this photograph and said, you guys are just awesome. And they said, oh, ah, no, hang on a minute. Um, wait till you hear us with our own instruments. That we've been learning each other's a bit the last couple of days. So they put down, they swapped around, picked up the one they'd actually been learning, they were just flipping brilliant. Now, I'd, already, I'd been impressed by the ones that they'd been playing with for a couple of days. And I saw how good they were with the whole thing. You know, it just was amazing. Here's another one um, from... This was another event. And I don't think you can read the detail of this. It would be a bit hopeful, really, even if, even if I zoom in on it a bit for you. Um, but the key thing here was really to look at the dates. And, um, and this lad had... Uh, he came to see me... Uh, in October of last year and he got a bit fed up waiting for his classmates to keep up in maths and he thought, I know, if I write an iPhone app that helps them with their maths, they might be a bit better at maths and I won't have to keep waiting for them uh, he's an Australian kid and, uh, and so he did that and, and it worked rather well. When I met him he said to me, oh um, uh, professor, he said I, I, I need to know more about programming um, what do you program in? I, I, so I showed him Ruby on Rails, you know, which is quite cool stuff. And he said, where might I learn more programming? I said, why don't you enrol for an open university module um, in England, which he tried to do. He's only 15, and it's a bit difficult. So in the end, he enrolled for an open um, university modules in, in Australia. Then I got this letter from him, um, which was back in... Um, gosh, when was it? It was back in February, 6th of February. And he said, oh, hi, do you remember me? Um, I was at the school where we were doing the iPhone app and he's saying, look, it's all gone pretty well I'm heading towards can you just see there, I'm heading towards two high distinctions and, um, and, a, and, a, and a plain distinction on my assignment, so you know, he'd only enrolled for this lot, November, December January, here we are in February he's been in the thing for three months, he's picking up three degree level distinctions, and then he says, um, it's actually going pretty well that my application's downloaded 
1,400 um, copies on the first day, and I'm doing a steady two to 300 a day. So next term, I'm going to have to do probably only two university modules alongside my school because I'm setting up a business with my dad to sell iPhone apps. You know. <laughs> I just come back to, we don't really know how good these little blighters could be. Here's um, uh, This one's the most interesting, I think. This is a group of children I've been delighted to work with in, uh, in Lampton School in West London uh, who won a competition to build a classroom of tomorrow. And um, they won £20,000. That's about $30,000, isn't it? Some, something like that. It seemed like a lot of money. To make over their classroom, to turn it into a classroom of tomorrow. And they said all sorts of interesting things, not the least of which, we don't want to build a classroom of tomorrow, we'd like to build a classroom of today, please. That was one of the reasons they won the money. You know. They also, when they, having won the money, they, they sat and thought, if we spend it all on technology, in three years' time we'll have old computers and still be in a, I think the word they used was crap, classroom. Whereas <laughs> if we spend the money on the classroom and make sure that whatever we've got in our pockets and a few things that we provide as well, if everything, everything that comes through that door works, in three years' time it'll still be a gorgeous classroom and the stuff we got in our pockets will be three years more up to date, so that will be fab too. That's what they did. And... Um, that's what the room looked like from the outside. It's one of those old huts. It's what it looks like from the other side. A bit like me, it don't get any better from behind. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but the classroom they built was pretty impressive. It's full of detailed stuff. They said, um, well, one of the things they said, by the way, was these kids live under the flight path of Heathrow Airport. The, you know, they can't work out of doors because you can't speak. There's this constant plane noise. They'd always dreamt of working out of doors, so one of their ideas was to fill the thing with astroturf so it would be like being out of doors. But one of the list of things that they had on their what should a classroom have, where they said that we wanted it to be, I think the phrase was hotel clean. Now, it's an interesting phrase, because this is a very tough part of West London. I'm confident none of them had ever stayed in a hotel. But they had that sense that hotels were somewhere that were a lot cleaner than schools, you know. And... Um, so they talked to the cleaners, and they said, if we put AstroTurf down, can you, keep it, can you keep it clean? And the cleaners said, have you ever tried to get vomit out of AstroTurf? It's really not, really not going to work, you know. <laughs> they said, yep, see your point. I can see where you're coming from there. So um, they talked to the cleaners about the floor cover. They had tables that were at multiple heights. They said, sometimes we like to work standing up, you know, sometimes sitting down, sometimes, sometimes lying down. I mean, the... Um, they were very wise. They looked at themselves. They noticed, for example, that when they were at home and they wanted to read, they didn't go to their mum and say, Mum, I'm thinking about reading a book. I wonder if I can borrow a chair from the kitchen because I can't, unless I've got my back properly upright, you know, I can't really focus on the pages properly. You know. They looked when they were on holiday and they noticed that people didn't drag the chairs from the dining room down to the beach to sit on the beach reading, you know, they, they read on towels and they read spread out. So they thought, maybe if the school wants us to read, we sh they should look at how we sit when we read, and we sit pretty comfortably. So they, um, there's the kids, that, that's them, um, and, um, uh, and the furniture they put in was comfortable furniture. It was comfortable furniture. They said, look, wouldn't it be nice if every writing surface was every surface, if everything that's white in that space you could write on? The desktops, the walls, the doors, uh, everything. You know. They said, wouldn't it be great if we had mood lighting? Because there's something about coming into the same place every day for a year. It kind of gets to you after a while, you know. Um, and so they had mood lighting. It can be purple, it can be red, it can be any colour you like, you know. Um, they did have some astroturf. Look on that tiered seating. They put a bit of astroturf up there. They didn't lose sight of the whole idea. What's been fascinating about this classroom, it opened last November. I'm actually flying, I'm flying back from here to, to Venice and then from Venice to London to open it. I'm going to cut the tapes, I'm very excited. But they've been in it since November. Those kids refused to go home this Easter holiday. 15-year-old kids, Easter holidays, they said, um, we're not going, we're going to stay. So every day they've come in. No teachers, the teachers said... Look, we're knackered, you know, don't expect us to show up every day. It's Easter, you know. I'm going to France, you know. <laughs> going to Paris, you know. going to Revolution 11. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Twelve, we're still in. 
<laughs> but the kids said, no, no worries, we'll just, we'll just book ourselves in, you know, we'll, we'll look after it. And every single day through the Easter holidays, the kids turned up, registered themselves, sat down, and used their club. Now, a classroom that children will not leave at night, where they're 45 minutes early to school because they want to get in and get their best spaces, and where when the Easter holidays come, they will not go home, is not bad, is it? It was designed by children. And it only cost £20,000 for the whole thing, including the technology. Now, this doesn't have to be expensive. We just have to listen. And, boy, do we learn that in space. Let's have a quick glance at a few other people's um, classrooms from around the world um, just, just briefly. I think we've maybe got time just to... We won't, I won't dwell on all these, but we'll have a quick, a quick skim through some, some of them. Here's... Um, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, there's, look, that's, isn't that a lovely, playful space? Um, this is a super class. I'm going to come back to those in a, in a bit. Look, this is a, this is a classroom just outside West London, designed to be like a stage. You, know, you don't know what that is, do you, when you arrive? Is that an armadillo, or is it a, an alien, or is it a spaceship, or is it... I don't know. Imagine if every day you walk up to your class, you dream of it being something else. This is a fast room in a college in Blackpool, desperately poor Blackpool in England, where... It's fast food, fast network, fast printing, fast everything. You just, you, when you've only got a few minutes, you get everything really quickly in that one space. This is, um, this is lovely. This is a place where the local community had no idea how good the kids were. So for a month, we took over all the advertising in the whole town, in Bilston. And I parachuted an artist-in-residence into the schools. And the artist-in-residence worked with the children. Say, hi, oh, this was thing everybody did together. Uh, and the artists in residence worked with the children to capture adverts of the things that the kids were good at. And it was their music clubs, their rhythm and blues clubs, it was everything really. You know, and at the end of the month, the whole town's view of those children had changed. You know, because what they saw, and this is the battle for hearts and minds that you have with your federal government, let alone your local government, what they saw was that children are an investment. Somehow we've lost sight of that. In the West, I think. We, we used to think of children as our investment. Now we think of them as a cost. How might we reduce the cost of learning? Not as in Singapore, what might we spend the money on next? Um, they know that whatever they spend, they get back in national income. Three, four, five, ten years down the line. It doesn't matter what you spend on education, you'll get it back and more anyway. So the question is, how can we spend money on learning? In the West, we're thinking, how can we save money on learning? And that's a fatal Fatal, fatal error. It's not, a, not an error you're making here. Because you, you know, you're focusing on your kids, but not much of the West is. Those adverts sure as heck helped. Here's, um, these are lovely little spaces. When you just want a little bit of privacy in your, in your, your room, you just blow up, and not in a Revolution in Leaven sort of way, you, know? you, just, you just blow up a little seminar room, and, um, and there it is. Here's, um, I built these just west of London. We'll have a look at these maybe... A little, bit, a little bit later. These are lovely. These are bits of furniture built by the school. This is New Line Academy in um, Folkestone in Kent, east of England. They built these bits of furniture because they had so many children in the class when they wanted to talk to all the children at once. How do you get an intimate, quiet conversation with a lot of children? The answer is you build this tiered seating and park them on. It was a tech project for the school. This is a library in Alaska where they were short of money. And they thought we, we value the library. I really do believe in school libraries. And it's hugely, hugely important. Uh, I got asked on television. Well, no, thank you. I, got, I mean, uh, I got asked on television, you're like this, whether um, if a school had not enough money for a librarian or a head teacher, who would they lose? And I said, I'd keep the librarian every time. You know? <laughs> 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 because to be honest, you know, who else prototypes that new model of learning? Who else has that? You see, the internet doesn't do history very well. It doesn't have that pathway. It doesn't have that learning journey. The way that librarians hold that knowledge in their head, you know, it doesn't have that used book counter. But, 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 the best school libraries, a third of the space is full of children's work. So, you know, but nothing more exciting as a kid than knowing that your work has been archived in the library. Did a research project once of asking a thousand children what their best piece of work was, where it is now. Had their parents ever seen it? Almost without exception, it was an examination piece. They didn't know where it was now, and their parents had never seen it. What a dismal way to encourage kids to say, give us your best piece of work, and I promise you, you'll never see it again, and we'll shred it. I mean, this is not, 
This is not the way to motivate them. But I'll tell you what, give us your best piece of work and I'll put it in the library and it'll be there for your great-grandchildren to see. It's a very powerful way of doing it. So, you know, libraries have to move on too, but I don't see a world without them. Well, they turn their library into their reception area. So when you come into the school, you come into the library. When you're waiting, you're waiting in the They're not waiting outside. I've got a PhD student, I just had a PhD student, who was in prison. Um, and when I go to the prison, I'd turn up, go through the door, sign in, get a badge, sit waiting in a cold corridor. It was exactly the same as approaching a secondary school. It was exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly better coffee, but otherwise indistinguishable. Isn't it? Why wouldn't the reception be the library? Why wouldn't that big desk in the middle of the library be a place for greeting and meeting as well? Well, of course, it can be. Here's, um, well, there's that oven. This is a playful elementary space in a school in China. This is a library space in Thailand where they wanted to get boys reading. And what better than making it a bit of a challenge? You want to be a good reader, you get up there on the top shelves and read them. <laughs> Relatively few fatalities at this stage. I mean, it's been quite... <laughs> they got loads of folk, you know. Um, <laughs> no, actually, look, it's <laughs> look, it's bolted to the ceiling, honestly. There it is. <laughs> and these are these are cra these are crash mats. Whoops, these are crash mats down at the floor level. You can, you, but you see that's. <laughs> but look, crucially, boys boys reading. It worked. And um, you know, people are just trying a mass of good stuff. This is a shopping mall converted into a school and university. This is an outdoor space converted with, with repurposed sailboat sails. This is a library space uh, in Australia. Um, this, is, this is a space in the Netherlands. For, they, they, they worry like you worry about fidgeting teenage boys. They do flip, they do fidget. So this is designed, they have to fidget. These chairs, if you don't fidget, you fall off them. It's really, really simple. You know, you, <laughs> they're just, the chairs are not stable, so you... The minute you start sitting on them, you really have to sort of, you know, and it's, um, hey, great. This is, this is shoes off. We'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Here's, um, oh, this is the biggest elementary school I know. This is Canberra Primary in, in Singapore, 3,500 children, all under 11. I mean, it's kind of big. And, uh, and, and you, you, you know, <laughs> um, the only place I know where they have a chill-out garden for children and staff, you go in and just sit around the carp pond and the only, the only rule is nobody speaks and they're all sort of sitting there trying to de breathing deeply and back out into the three and a half thousand kids. But the, the school only functions because every big kid has a little kid to look after. Every little kid has a big kid as their mentor. And every little kid is chasing after the role model of the older children. It's really, really hard for teenagers to misbehave when they're looking after little people. Really, really difficult to do. It's actually, it's really hard for boys to misbehave when they got their shoes off. I mean, I love, absolutely love, the whole shoeless learning, which sweeps through um, Scandinavia in particular. Every school I'm involved with, including the classroom that you saw that the children had designed, are shoes off spaces. Something mystical happens when boys in particular take their shoes off. But my, my hypothesis, and this is not well tested, is that some... <laughs> Somehow, I think, that testosterone is in the shoe, you know. <laughs> As they pull it off, you know, they, they, oh, they turn into puppy dogs, you know, and a lovely sort of, you know, oh, go on, so all right, you know. <laughs> it works wonderfully. There's something about family, about taking your shoes off. There's something about something quite spiritual, something quite mystical, depending on where you are in the world. But it flipping well works. The kids that designed that classroom for themselves had seen other shoes off schools, and we will make this a shoes off classroom. They're out in the middle of a mud, muddy field. But when you arrive, you take your shoes off. That way their new carpet stays clean. When the head teacher arrived, Dame Sue John, when she arrived um, to visit them for the first time, they completely ignored her. They looked through her when she spoke to them. They didn't hear her. She, didn't, she was not in the room because she got her shoes off. And eventually one of them just pointed at her feet. And she realised, took her shoes off, and they said, oh, hello, Miss didn't see you standing there. You know. <laughs> she was invisible until she took her shoes off. That's how much they care about. When you say to 14, 15-year-olds, I want you to take your shoes off in learning, they say, oh, thank goodness. And all your preconceptions are wrong. Your feet aren't smelly. They're smelly because you have your shoes on. You know, not... <laughs> anyway, let's not dwell on these too much. Um, but, here's a, but here's a Skype bar. I love these. Skype bar in a classroom, you just 
have a few screens at the back whose sole purpose is to let you chat to other schools elsewhere and talk about what they're doing in a day in their life, what they're doing uh, in their school, what they're having for lunch, what they're swapping with each other, how their version of your project is going. Um, we're going to tunnel down into some of these in the breakout session, but let me look at one of those projects. This is such a nice project. Here's a, a very simple project. It's to take locally um, 100 faces and their order in the sequence is their age. So the ninth one is 9, the 10th one is 10, the 11th one. So this is, sorry to do this to you this time of morning, but this is your life going past here, really. This is um, sort of fast forward on your life. Let me just move, the, um, move that out of the way a little, a little bit. So here goes your life whizzing past. And, um, oops, it is. And it all goes a bit wrong in your 20s, to be honest. This lot all look pretty happy, you know, cheerful. Then you can see the strain starting to sort of... It's all, hair's all gone, you know. It's all pretty desperate. Um, just imagine doing this in Evansville. Just imagine the places you've got to go to find 100 people um, that seem to flow together in a nice way. Just imagine who would and wouldn't want to make a contribution. They, the kids couldn't find anybody who would admit to being 54. Uh, I... I I don't know why. Is anybody 54 in here? Well, b bravely done. That's a <laughs> they needed you, you know. <laughs> they, this bloke was 53 when they took his picture, and they, they were looking for so long he became 54, you know. <laughs> they, um, they picked up all sorts of other little details. This was, um, oh, gee, look, they, they could pick up smokers. They said, look, she's a smoker, they said, because, look, she looks way out of sequence, because, you see how your skin ages so much faster, you know, which... You can say that to kids, they'd never believe you when they see it for themselves. You know. One of the fascinating things about this, by the way, was how sharp people were as you get towards the end of the sequence. And imagine they've had to go off into residential care homes and, oh, good Lord, I think we've lost one. Look, this one. <laughs> this, this project was a while ago, so, you know. <laughs> but if you can make it through your 80s, you just look at how sharp-eyed this lot are. Look at this, 92... 93, 94, 95. This old fella, the kids said to him, because these are primary age children, they said to him, aren't you afraid you're going to die because you're really old? You know how blunt children are with all this. You know? <laughs> and he didn't, he didn't miss a blink. He leant forward and he said, he said, you know, I've got a better chance of being 96 than any one of you. Which is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good answer, you know. <laughs> do the math, you know. Now, of course, what you do next, then, is then look around the world for another place to do this. And the shock for this group of children when they did that was they struggled to find places where they could find 100 people. In West Africa, they were struggling to find people in their 50s. Uh, you know, in many parts of the world, it was all over in your 70s. So, you know, what a nice way just to pick up the power of communicating with others and join up those challenges in such a simple way. Let's, let's have a quick look. We've got time, I think, to look at um, some of the things that, that people are doing in their schools. These are practical things you can do right now that are going to work. And I won't spend long on any of them, um, but again, I've given you a Google term up in the top right-hand corner. Um, this is Derek Thompson's work up in Scotland. He, he gave out half sets of Nintendo DS. He's got the kids to play the brain training game every morning before they started school. And, of course, brain training doesn't make you sharper. There's no ripple in the gene pool. There's no finessing of the cerebral cortex or anything like that. But what it does do, as that little girl said, it, it makes it cool to be brainy around here. They had a, a ladder on the wall. The top ten kids in the wall were on the ladder. And um, you, had to, you, had to, you had to do really well to get on there. Teachers did not make it. I mean, they were, they were wiped out. They were desperately trying to stay ahead of the eight-year-olds, to be honest. You know, it, was, um, it worked. Here's another simple little thing. Getting kids to do a learn-over. You know, finding children around the world to spend 24 hours together with. You come into school, you sleep over in the computer room, and for 23 of the other hours, another school somewhere shows you the cool stuff they're doing with tech. And if you haven't, I'm sure you've all been to education.skype.com and seen the enormous number. Well, shall I just, just take a moment to show you just to... Um, if you go to... Um, education.skype.com you'll find all the other schools in the world that want to Skype and do projects with you and look here's the last 250 schools to register and you can see they're all over the place they're just looking for projects right now that you can 
you can join in, you know, 13,000 teachers um, or, or whatever. So those learnovers are great. But the great fun thing about, about that is that each hour somebody else talks about their school. You have to try and stay awake to, uh, to, 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 to find out the, about the other people's places. Here's another um, simple little thing. This was us um, giving video cameras to very young children and getting them to do 14-year-olds work. So we took the science work of 14-year-olds, gave it to 10-year-olds, gave them a video camera and said, don't write it up formally, which we knew they couldn't do. We said, talk about experimental error and, your cam and use the camera as your writing tool. Those kids were easily able to do the science. It was the formality of writing it up that had stood in their way. Here's another um, simple little thing. Well, that's that um, 100 faces in 100 places thing we were just talking about. And here's... Um, Here's, uh, interesting, if you're near enough to, uh, to a university, getting your kids to go and sit in on university classes in the um, Australian School of Maths and Science in Adelaide, from 11 years onwards, their children spend four hours a week at university. They go to university, they sit in on the classes, they follow what the undergraduates are doing, they just do it. And um, at this point, they're keeping up. You think back to when you were an undergraduate, to be honest... By the time you'd done the boozing and snogging and all the other bits, you know, the, the, learning, the learning bit wasn't such a big part of your life anyway. So, of course, 11-year-olds can keep up with it. I see you remember. You know. <laughs> I was walking through the refractory at Bournemouth University the other day. The students came out to me and said, do you want to come to a foam party? I said, oh, I do, but I've probably I've, I've, the moment's passed, I think, you know, <laughs> in truth, you know. Um, some brave schools are shutting their staff room for part or whole of the year. I say, yeah, just reopen it as a chill-out space. Let's make it a reward for children's maturity. And you get to a certain age in the school, you get to share the staff room with us. You get to come on in there, but the space we get is for a better coffee bar. Other schools are... This one's really interesting. Let's spend a moment or two on this. is super classes. I got in big trouble in my early school career for, for advocating small classes. I'm not in big trouble with my colleagues and with the kids who like the idea, but big trouble with the authorities who were saying, you can't have small classes. Now I find myself speaking up for enormous classes. How can that be? Why is it when I go around Australia, I find kids in classes of 60, 90, 100? That class at the bottom there is a kindergarten class of 125 children. It's the quietest class I've been into, children of that age, in the last five years. How could it possibly work? Well, it works. There's a lot of real detail about how this works. And I would say that if you don't do the detail, it doesn't work. It is chaos. If you do the detail, it works really well. Let's imagine you've got 90 kids. Let's not be overambitious. And three, three teachers. That's be the three in the, in the front row here. And they wear coloured badges. A red badge, a green badge, a blue badge. You, you pick the colours. You know. and, and the blue badge man is the, is the person who's leading the lesson. He's saying, right, we need to start now, this is what our tasks are, this is what you'll need to do by the time you finish. These are typically longer blocks of teaching. And you wouldn't do this every day, but, it's, but it sure as heck breaks the monotony. And the red badge person is doing the stretching, the broadening, the differentiation, the, the saying, look, I know you know this stuff, but why don't I... Do you remember when you were young and a teacher said to you, you're not supposed to know this yet, but I'm going to tell you anyway. You know, and you, ooh, you know, you've got that sort of secret knowledge of next year. You know, why, why wouldn't that be part of every lesson? And that's what our green badge man is, is stretching you or saying, actually, look, I know, you know Newtonian physics is not your bag, but, um, and I know you like Harley Davidson's, but let's think about you know, Harley Davidson with a shaft drive sort of twitches when you change gear. That's centripetal force going on there. So let me kind of nudge the lesson into an area that you care about. And the, um, the last person is a bit like those breakdown vans that come and rescue you when your car breaks down. You know, they're looking for nothing else apart from kids who look lost. And you look a bit stuck. And they're looking for that all the time. And you know, there's no shame in calling over, I'm looking for the green badge person. I'm going to come over, over here, you know, because I just don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, of course, in any classroom, great teachers do those things. Of course, somebody's leading and narrating. I mean, of course... There's differentiation and breadth and stretch. You know, and of course, there's that remedial repair work. But the thing is, one great teacher doing it in series, it's a long time before you get spotted as stuck. Three teachers doing it in parallel, and you don't miss a heartbeat. You know, the minute you're stuck, there's somebody on you, on the hard shoulder, saying, this is what you need, let me, let me show you what you didn't get. I, I know you weren't here last week because you got caught up in the volcanic ash thing. And, oh, goodness, you know. <laughs> and here's your help right now. And it turns out, 
the, the, you get through five terms of work in only three terms. The pace is breathtaking. When you walk into those super classes, they are going so fast. It really does take your breath away. And the kids are focused and so on. There's the shoeless schools as a typical example of a kid. Don't put slippers on. This is shoeless. You know, it's not, you don't want to walk around with Kermit on their feet or whatever. Here's, um, uh, here's another one. Oh, that's turning shops into... Do you have a lot of empty shops here? We've got one in seven shops empty in England at the moment. One in seven. I'll tell you what, some of them make fabulous learning spaces. You know, taking over a shop in the town centre, clearing it of all the old rubbish that was in there, putting in a display of your children's best work, getting a few teachers to staff it, a few retired teachers to staff it, and narrate it, and getting some parents in. So anybody doing the shopping, pop in for a cup of coffee and see how good your kids are. What that does to your children's self-esteem, what it does to your community's understanding, is just absolutely phenomenal. Here's another one, and I want to just dwell on this one for a, um, for a moment. This is simply the, the formal idea of, of talking to and listening to children, hang on a minute, of talking to and listening to children um, as part of redesigning the learning process. And we do this a lot, and I know you do this as well. How many of you would, would always use children to interview new staff when they come to your school? How many schools is that? Is that normal here? Oh, you've got to try that. Really, yeah. So we have, we, we, are you, seven, you, you would struggle to find a job in England without being interviewed by children as well. Uh, now, the, the children don't have the vote. They don't say, he looks like a softy, we'll have him, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the kids will sometimes say, you know, um, I just, I just, he just didn't feel right, you know. And sometimes they'll just give a little bit of feedback, but most often they'll say, I thought he was the one that was really going to challenge us because when, he, when we asked him a question... He answered it straight looking us in the face rather than answering it to the adult that was in the room. You know. We like him because he likes children. And, uh, and then we went a stage beyond that of starting asking our children to formally sit at the back of class and watch us teach and feed back good ideas about us teaching. Let me just play a little clip from, um, um, from, from, from that. And Steve, we're going to need the audio for this, for this bit, mate, I think. When he looked out of his window, she'd see the ponds with his little But what does he actually Making learning better was the brainchild of Matthew Savage, who first introduced it into the English department. Two or three months later, he went and told Miss Jeffrey, and she said, yeah, it's a brilliant idea. Um, and it was introduced throughout the school. OK, I've got everyone's attention. Within English, when I came here, I wanted to transform the way in which English was taught. I wanted to kind of raise the stakes a bit. Yeah, haunted. They don't just swim in the pond. They haunt the local pond. Yeah, and the dragonflies, they don't just fly around. They flit So M MLB started as MEB, making English better. I figured that the best way to find out how learning and teaching could be improved would be to ask the kids. You know, OK, your lessons aren't as fun as they should be. How can we make them more fun? You're not learning as much as you should. How could you learn more? Basically throwing it open to the kids, because my experience in previous schools is that we underestimate and ignore the views of, of students, of the student community at our peril. I wanted students to start to provide some input into how we could raise the stakes. I wanted students to help us to make teaching better, to make learning better, to make the whole learning experience a far more quality experience. I wanted them to feel proud, not only of being at George Mitchell, but proud of uh, being in the lessons that George Mitchell delivers. And that's not an over-ambitious target, is it? I just want our children to be proud of what's going on. Now, you will not do this without your kids. You will not build great third millennium learning without their absolute involvement at every stage, at every moment. And I suspect the same is true of their... I hope you appreciate the subtitles, but I'll put that on for your, the accent I thought it was going to be. <laughs> it's going to be tough for you, isn't it? <laughs> well, you never know. Um, by the way... A quick thought about 21st century. I was in a school. I won't tell you where this was. This is actually in, in, the, in America, and I won't tell you which state because I don't, I don't want to embarrass Michigan, but it, was, um, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't so far away. You know. um, I, as I was walking through the school last year, I came across this special room for the 21st century. And I thought, well, that's a bit odd since that's the, last, that's the place we've been for the last decade. You know, if, you're, if you're a 10-year-old kid, you own, you've only ever lived in the 21st century. So... People starting now to talk about 21st century learning, it's a bit late, mate, you know. So, 
But I thought, I wonder what's in the room. I was quite excited. So I, I nipped inside to see what was there. And the room was empty. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I never did find out. But um, it kind of raises a question about if the room was for the 21st century, what was the rest of the school for? And I think that's a big challenge for us. His, what, what a school is certainly not for is, um, is keeping kids out of the process. This is, I helped set up Teachers Television, which has been, it's just closed actually, it's just been being reopened again. And I think the Gates Foundation is funding a teaching channel over here, which is born on the back of all this. So you, you'll get all these programmes, I think. Three and a half thousand, four thousand programmes by teachers about how to teach by teachers for teachers. And it was fab. This is, though, um, back in um, uh, 2007, this is a graph of the children that were watching Teachers TV. And to our amazement, uh, in each period, look, here's, this, is the, this is the wits and half term. 432,000 children, that's nearly half a million kids. We haven't got that many, we've got China. You know, we're watching a channel dedicated to teaching by teachers for teachers. They absolutely adore reflecting on their teaching. They love to think about how might it be better. They think, I wonder how they're doing it somewhere else. I wonder how it might be improved. I wonder what, you know, they're sitting there in your class. Probably some of your kids have been watching it. It used to be www.teachers.tv. They're sitting there thinking, oh, miss, I really wish you'd seen that programme about... Look, here's a... Here's an example, you know, it's a silly example really, but this is on, on, on YouTube. This is, um, this is how to multiply by drawing lines, and this is how they do multiplication in Japan. It's rather cute. So uh, I'm going to multiply 21 by 13, and I'm going to do that by doing two lines and one line for the 21, and then I'm going to do one line and three lines for the 13. And then what I'm interested in here is where the lines cross in the three columns, if you see what I mean, left, middle, and right. So how many places do the lines cross over on the right-hand column? Uh, looks to me like three. How many over on the left-hand column? Uh, looks to me like two. How many in the middle? And, of course, you've got, you've got two lots there. You've got the one, two, three, four, five, six there, and one more, seven there. Are you with me so far? Well, that's all you need to be, because that's the answer right there. It's done, you know. Simple as that. I mean, that's quite impressive, isn't it? That's, <laughs> uh, wow, you know. <laughs> that really works, you know. It's, uh, I, you'll go away and try this, you know. <laughs> People are getting their pens out. There are loads of paper at the front here. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> knew it was there for a reason. If you, do, if you do carryovers, of course, you know, the, if that middle column had been, I don't know, if that had been uh, um, 11, you'd carry over the one into the next column, so one there, and you'd add the two. Wow. Is that, was that supposed to happen, or was that...? Oh, OK. That's, yeah, somebody just leaning on the buttons. <laughs> I was just in Christchurch last year when they had an earthquake, you know. It was, uh, that was the most um, agitated I've been in bed for a long time, actually. It was quite... It was like, whoa. <laughs> I'm going, I'm going back, you know. <laughs> now, where are we? Oh, we're running out of, we're running out of time a bit. Um, I've got three more things I really want to say to you loud and clear. I mean, first, I think we need to take phones pretty seriously. Um, this was me in a, in a classroom um, six months or so ago. The kids had a phone on the table... They were capturing the key revision points of their lesson. I think they were using audio boo, but it could have been a th one of a thousand things. And I thought, ooh, that's interesting. And I got out my phone to take a picture of their phone doing their revision uh, summary, at which point the class blogger leapt up. There she is in the, in the background with her phone, taking a picture of me with my phone, taking a picture of them with their phone, you know. <laughs> and I thought, I think this stuff might have arrived, you know. <laughs> this might be real. And, and of course... It is, um, but it's very different, I think, phone technology. I think we're at this moment of post-appropriation. I think most of the technologies that have come along so far in my lifetime, and the first computers I put into schools, I had the build before I put them in. You know, this was, um, uh, you know, if you didn't have a soldering iron, you didn't have a computer sort of time. This was in the 70s. I'm really, really old, you know. <laughs> um, most of those things, well, some of you will have remembered 
calculators and being told to bring the right sort of calculator to school. It had to be the Texas Instruments one or the whatever, you know. How many, how many people in here use the slide rule? Cool, those arms went up a bit slower, didn't they? Really? <laughs> yeah, the old joints going. But uh, um, <laughs> it had to be... Oh, I know how you feel. It had to be... It had to be the right slide rule. If you'd have turned up with a, a circular slide, a cylindrical slide rule, got a wrong slide rule, young fellow. You know. I've not come across a school that's got a class set of phones. I've not come across a, a school that said, any phone you like, but it must be the Android, whatever, or the iPhone. or what. Kids just turn up with phones. And, and schools, in their foolishness, have tried to ban them often. Um, we've, I was in a school the other day, actually, where the kids had been banned from using phones and, and they did tell me that but I forgot I was working with the children and I'd done quite a complex little d drawing on that well, just a conventional whiteboard it wasn't a Promethean or smart thing around. I just drew it you know but you know when you're drawing on the board how you there's quite a narrative there you're sort of trying to make a point and you draw around it and you emphasize it and your arrows and little smiley faces there's a whole narrative in your in your class illustrations you know and I just said to the kids oh look okay take a picture of that because that will be useful and they said we're not allowed phones. And I said, oh, oh, no, I forgot. I said, but you've all got them, haven't you? They said, oh, yeah, no, we've all got them, you know. <laughs> so, so I said, oh, well, um, I'll get about. So they all got about and took a picture. And I said, well, so what happens then in the school when they, try to, when they try to confiscate your phone? They said, oh, we all carry a sacrificial phone. We've got one of, a, one of a dad's old phones, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the school office and said... <laughs> Show me the box of confiscated phones. And it was like, it was like a box of phone museology, you know. It was like, <laughs> I've never seen so many rubber keys, you know. And we're like, well, wow, look at that, you know. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> so these things are there. And we would be mad not to use them. We'd be mad not to use all the other technologies that are there that have become the other side of that appropriation wall. We'd be foolish, I think, not to be using um, Facebook and Twitter and all those other things in the cloud. If you're interested in that, go to cloudlearn.net. And Cloudlearn's a project I'm involved with that Nominet are, uh, are sponsoring, where we're crowdsourcing people's good practice. And I know some of you are already using Facebook in the classroom, so if you are, you know, the Cloudlearn crowd would welcome your ideas too. But it's probably, there's probably 10 or 20 things you need to get right to use Facebook in the classroom. But when you do, some of the best careers teaching I've seen in my career has been in Facebook, and I've seen it in the last year. Some of the best history teaching I've seen has been in Twitter. Just stunning stuff. Went into a classroom two years ago. There was a... It was gorgeous. There was a, there was a little um, wooden hut in the playground. The lights were all down. The teacher had pushed all the desks into one side of the class. They all jammed together. She got running on a, just a projector, not an ambitious um, um, whiteboard or anything, just a projector. She'd got... Pathé newsreel footage of German stormtroopers goose-stepping through a, a, a town in, in Europe. I, I guess Germany, but it could have been anywhere. And the teacher was walking on top of the desks, shining a really strong flashlight in, through the crack between the desks. And underneath the desks, the kids were all sitting on the floor with what light there was, trying to read the diary of Anne Frank. It was the most stunning. Um, less of the you know, hair, hair stood up on the back of your neck. And the homework was... And if Anne had had a mobile phone, what text might she have sent to her mates? You know? the, the kids just texted in their thoughts, their homework. I mean, lovely, lovely, lovely stuff. This technology is so seductive, so engaging, it's so powerful. Why would we ever not want to embrace all of it? But you can't just turn it on. You've got to think about what works, what works appropriately, and go to the cloud learn thing, and you'll see heaps of good advice. That advice is so good that just the other day, Australia decided they were unlocking Facebook for for all their schools right across um, uh, Western Australia, which was nice, I think. So, um, last couple of things. And, and uh, I think I've only got two last big things to say to you, I think. One, one is this. Uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think we can build any more a model of learning on what kids can't do. You know, I think I've been to so many schools where the walls are covered in stuff the kids can't do, places the kids can't use their phones. Um, I love this one. The computer lab is only available if you're in detention. I mean, it's extraordinary. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing beyond here. You know, don't even think about it. Um, don't, uh, oh, no, that's interesting. You know? <laughs> um, but it turns out 
it turns out that... <laughs> it turns out that a little bit of humour and a little bit of playfulness makes an enormous difference. And it's just starting to help me to understand how valuable learning might be. And that understanding... Uh, I'll, I'll give you this example. I'm, ho I'm hoping, I think, that none of you are going home... Um, and anybody flying on a plane in the next week or so? Oh, gosh, I'm really sorry um, for what I'm about to do. But um, <laughs> I, got, I got approached by the air traffic controllers who said, um, they said, look, air traffic controllers don't learn very well. This is the bad news, you know. <laughs> A lot of them failed to pass their exams, and the ones who passed can't remember a damn thing about a month later. So they're all sitting there in the air traffic control thinking, what? It's, a, it's two wings. I don't know what it is, you know. It's, a, it's not a biplane. I know that. I just can't, you know. And, and I thought, well, I wonder if we just took everything that we know about what makes learning seductive in our, in our classrooms and applied it to air traffic controllers. I wonder how good they might be. That's what we did. So um, we took... Not expected you could read the small print here ju just yet. But, but we took basically everything we knew about, about current effective pedagogy, uh, about spaced learning, you know, with the learning where you stop and start and do mindless things, about what we knew about closed procedure. I mean, good primary practice, really. And we embedded that in the way that they were taught. And secondly, we thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we took the playfulness that we know is so effective and put it into their learning space? So we ripped the heart out of their teaching space, we put that old door on from an aeroplane, so this is now their kitchen, when they go to eat a meal they sit on little aircraft seats and have their meal, they eat out of plastic trays, it's already very jolly you know. <laughs> we took those, do you have those top trump cards that, that you, where you, you sort of do you have top trump cards where you, you, you it's, a, it's a game that you play they usually have sort of super cards and you, you have to try and guess who's, some of you are nodding, I get younger ones you know um, we turned the aircraft recognition into a game of top trumps. Now, our air traffic controllers could not remember the aircraft at all after six weeks, ever. It was too hard. Two nights playing a card game with a little bit of money and some beer, um, <laughs> and they knew every plane. It's really interesting that, that that playfulness was enormously important. So almost my closing comment to you is, is just that, that... that I think we've been through a stage of people worrying about what education costs. We're just moving to a stage when, once again, we can think of it as an investment. But actually, what we know about learning compared to what others know about learning makes us very special indeed. If you stand on the roof of your schools and you say, where else in the community have I got a, a group of graduates thinking about something as complex as making technology work in learning, there's nowhere else in the community. It's not retail. It's not, not the banks. It's, not, it's nowhere else. It's you. You are the intellectual powerhouses at the centre of your communities. And this community here, you know, built on 200 years ago, 100 years ago, built on fast-flowing water, coal, you know, tick all the boxes on your geography textbook, you know, the thing that you've got that's special, the thing that you've got that is unique, the thing that you've got that leaves you the chance to put a footprint on the world, your mutuality, your collegiality, your willingness to swap and exchange with others. And if you don't do that, we have got no hope of mending the world with learning. My absolute belief is that that's what we can do. I've seen and you've seen that the least likely kids on the planet can be re-engaged with learning. Here's one closing child. This is a child thrown out of school, excluded, out of school completely for 18 months, re-engaged online as it happens. And we said to her, what's your dream in all this? And she said this. After college, I'm going to go to university. I am going to go. <laughs> because if they say no, I'll go back and fight again. If they say no again, I'll go back. <laughs> I will get into university and I'm going to train to be a midwife. The kids are absolutely unstoppable with all this. And around the world, you know that you can inoculate them against poverty with great learning. You know that communities of children learning together just want to hate each other a little bit less in the morning. And that 
is absolutely important. So you've got little chance here, not to influence the state, not to influence the federal policy making, not to influence other nations, but to swap your ideas with other communities just like you. And when you swap those ideas with others, you've got a chance to change the world. That opportunity doesn't come along very often in your professional career. You know, go away, have fun in your classrooms, swap your good ideas, be playful, be seductive. Never, ever believe people when they say you can't do that. And in doing so, you'll change the world. That's not a bad offer, is it? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>